If you were to think about you and your performance, you could separate it down into physical and mental. And then you could sub-separate the physical down into technical and fitness. So you would have technical, fitness, and mental. And then each of those would be subdivided into smaller headings. For example, in the fitness, it might be to do with strength, endurance, agility, balance, those kind of things. And then in mental, it might be to, to do with anxiety management, goal setting, discipline, and motivation, and tactical. Now, tactical is a mental aspect. It's a decision-making process based on information that you receive. Now, when I do my online coaching where people send me videos of them playing, nearly all of the things that I talk about are tactical. If you think about technical, how you hold the racket, how you swing, the point of contact, all of those things, often you might need to go backwards before you need to go forwards. You go backwards because it just doesn't feel comfortable for you. It's hard to maintain that new grip. You just can't get accustomed to making contact a little bit further or closer or whatever it is. The fitness one, well, that's definitely longer term. You're not gonna suddenly play much better squash after you've done one ghosting session or you've done one hill, sp hill sprint training session or core balance or anything. Fitness takes a while, but tactical can be immediate. You can make one small change in your game and suddenly see what's happening. It's as if you weren't utilizing all of your weapons. Your weapon. You might be quite fit, you might have quite good technique, but if you're making the wrong choices, the wrong, you're playing the wrong shots at the wrong time, you're probably going to be losing matches that you could be winning. So that's why I normally focus on the, uh, the tactical aspects during those video sessions because they bring immediate results. Now this video is going to highlight five areas that I would say would be quite generalizations. They might not apply to you, but they do apply to nearly most club players. And the first one is not using a decision-making process. We'll talk about the traffic light system, but there are other systems. The second one we're going to be thinking about is not using the full height of the front wall and the full height of the court. The next one is not uh, is thinking more about the speed that you hit the ball. Too many players think that hitting the ball hard and low will bring them benefits. The fourth one is not using the serve effectively. Now, I think that this is a perfect example of why club players shouldn't necessarily copy what professionals do, but I'll talk more about that. And then the last one is not taking the opportunities when they are presented to you, when you have created them. And that might be to do with confidence, but it's still a decision that can be made. So those are the things. You've seen the times where each one of those starts. Down the bottom are Google's, um, or YouTube, sorry, the chapter dividers in the progress bar. And if you haven't seen, those are, are, are quite new at the time of this video. And there are quick jump links in the text description. Over here are three teardrop rackets that I've reviewed, and the links to those reviews are also in the text description. So let's get started. Number one, decision-making processes. How you decide what shot to play, often you know called shot selection, can be an art and it can be a science. You can look at you know an analytics of matches that you've played and you can analyze those matches, but then sometimes people do things that they shouldn't necessarily do and they work. So there's no clear uh, science that you can learn or and apply and suddenly your game will be better. But you can have some processes that will help. Now, I often think that having a traffic light system really works, but there are others. Maybe I'll talk about those in a completely diff uh, separate video. But the traffic light system is essentially, you have red for defense. This is where you are under pressure. This is where the ball is very tight to the wall. This is where you are stretching. Those shots should give you time to allow you to get back to the tee, to allow you to reset the rally, I think is a phrase that um, the Squash TV 
um, commentators talking about resetting the rally back to sort of a, an equal position. I like to think of them as micro rallies. Within one big rally, there's often micro rallies and then they get reset by perhaps a defensive shot. So recognizing when you are under pressure is a really important skill. And it is a skill because often club players just run around and hit the ball. The phrase we used to use you know, back in the 90s in the UK was a headless chicken. This player is a headless chicken. He just runs and runs and runs, doesn't do any thinking, just keeps the ball going. And if you can realize as quickly as possible, I'm under pressure here, I need to play defensive. That's the red areas. And they're probably related to where the ball bounces on the, on the court, but not always. It could be uh, very close to the wall, could be coming at you. You're just under pressure. The ball is this far away, but you're having to run to it. So you're under pressure. It's behind you. Okay, lots of situations. The second one is, I think, the most interesting and which would we would call, or I call, the amber ones. These are the probing shots. Now, amber is the color that's used in British traffic lights, uh, yellow, perhaps, in other countries, is the idea that you play a shot that limits the opportunities that you're giving your opponent, but also is hoping to create opportunities for yourself, to probe, to test the situation. And most of the shots that you play into the back of the court, those are amber shots. Those are probing shots. You're not going to win the rally from it, but you probably won't lose the rally either. And you might think of those types of shots, if you're thinking about boxing, would be the jabs or the, the, the body shots. The shots that are hoping to drop the, the guard or lift the guard up to, to make it, I don't know, I don't know anything about boxing. But they're the shots that create the opportunities. And most of the shots you play should be those type of shots. But there needs to be a mental switch here, a mental shift. When you're on court, you shouldn't just be thinking, I'm just going to hit the ball to the back. You should be thinking, I'm going to hit the ball to the back as tight as possible with the right kind of bounce to create opportunities. I often talk about playing the ball with intent. If you don't know what exactly you're trying to do with the ball, then you're not maximizing that shot. And remember, by intent, I'm not saying that every shot should be a winner. You're not trying to hit every shot a winner. That would be going back to boxing. That would be like trying to have a knockout punch every single shot. You can't do it. Red, defense. Amber, probing. Looking for weaknesses, looking for weak returns. And then you've got the green, which is attack. This is where you've been given the opportunity. Now, this relates to the last one, which I've already mentioned is not taking those opportunities. But before you even take those opportunities, you have to have something in your mind that makes it very clear what type of shot is this. Because if you can't even recognize that this is an attacking opportunity, you can't even take it. Now, what is a red, an, a an amber, and a green shot depends very much on the situation. And I can't give you like a, a flow chart for you to go down. And I, I have heard coaches talk about this shot is wrong and this shot is wrong. And I don't like to prescribe this is wrong. You might have seen a video that I'll link to up here called the Y game. Sometimes when I'm coaching players, I used to stop them in the middle of a, of a, a rally. And I would ask one of the players, why did you do that? I'm not saying it was a bad shot. I'm just asking, why did you play that shot? And if you don't have a good answer, then you're hitting without thinking. You're not hitting with intent. Now, feel free to go and look on other videos on YouTube or talk to other coaches about decision-making processes, shot selection videos, anything that you want to. But take, use this video, this my blah, blah, blah in now as a catalyst for you to think more about what process our decision-making process am I using when I'm on court? The next one is the front wall and the height of the court. If you've ever played on a court that had the ceiling just above the outline on the front wall, you'll probably have realized how much space there is above a court. And I've mentioned this before, the, one of my favorite courts ever was in the BBC in um, West London. They had a court that was twice as high as the front wall. 
And I, I know that because I talked to the guy who was in charge of the building and he told me the exact height of the ceiling. It was like 13 meters and a squash court is 6.4, I think. Okay. Anyway, it was incredibly high. So we had a lot of fun playing incredibly high lobs. So when you've come, it's a bit like you don't notice what you've got until it's gone. If you ever play on a court that doesn't have a, a high ceiling, you know, you realize, well, you know, that's really quite low and you might touch the ceiling sometimes, but in general, club players don't use the height of the wall, uh, the front wall, and they don't use the height of the court. Now, this is something that we can definitely learn from pros. And when I talk about the serve, I'm going to have a, like an opposite example. Pros often use the height of their court so much more effectively than club players. Now, when you talk about the front wall, you only need to hit the ball at the front, at the top, when you're at the back. When you're in the middle. And when you're at the front part of the court, definitely in front of the tee, you only need to hit the ball just above the cut line. And it can be a very high shot, depending on how hard you hit it. You might need to go a little bit higher and a little bit softer. But all I want you to do after watching this video is become much more aware of how high it is. You could literally, in some clubs, you could cut the front wall into two thirds and never see the ball go above that line and never hit the ceiling. That there is height there. We need to be much more aware about the height. And something that is then connected with the height is the speed that we hit the ball. Too often club players hit the ball at one or two speeds. And I've talked about this before, having lots of different speeds. Changing the speed can be really useful. But when you change a speed, what do you need to do? you need to change the height that it hits on the front wall. So this second one is asking you to become much more aware about how high you hit the ball and much more conscious of the beneficial effects, especially from the back. If you're at the back sometime, you can hit the ball, you know, middle of the front wall, quite, you know, not this close to the, t the outline, but you know, maybe this close to the outline, get the ball wide. You can put your opponent under a lot of pressure and uh, pros do that quite a lot, and they definitely do it from the front, but for club players, it's less common. Use the height much more. Use variation of pace in conjunction with the height. Number three, hitting the ball too hard and low. Now, you could argue that this is exactly what, what number two was about using the front wall, and, um, using the height of the front wall, but, it, but I would argue it's not. What I see happen too often is a lot of club players think the harder you hit the ball, the faster you hit the ball, the less time you give your opponent, you're bound to win. But let's just follow that through a little bit, especially if you're older, like me. When you hit the ball hard and low, you've got more of a chance of hitting the tin. Okay, maybe you become an expert at hitting it this much above the tin, but where does it bounce? It bounces probably just before the short line. The short line is the line on the floor that designates where the serve has to be. Where does it then bounce? Well, it then might bounce, depending on where you've made contact with the ball, it might take a second bounce in the nick. Oh, fantastic, that's the perfect length, isn't it? Mm, sometimes. What does it force your opponent to do? It forces your opponent to hit the ball early. If you are young and fast, that's fantastic. If your opponent panics because they've got this really big swing, maybe that's fantastic. But I often see club players hitting the ball hard and low, and then more experienced players half volleying it, which is just hitting it almost immediately after it bounces. A little bit of topspin. Yes, you can hit topspin in squash. Uh, or even just playing a soft little working boast. And suddenly, the person who's hit the ball hard, especially if they're from the back, is having to do more work. Squash is not about how hard you hit the ball. Squash is about where you hit the ball. If you can keep it tight, if you can get it into the corners, you'll be more effective than if you can hit it at 200 miles an hour and it bounces short. You might have some success, but the reality is that the better players you play against, the less successful that technique, that tactic will be against players. And we all love to hit the ball hard, we do. I have to admit, I know I haven't played for nearly two years now, that I do notice a significant drop in my power now that I'm in my 50s compared to when I was in my 20s. And 
that's, that's, that's disappointing. Smacking the ball as hard as you can is great fun. It's one of the things about squash, isn't it? In tennis, if you maybe hit it too hard, it just goes out. In squash, if you just hit it too hard, as long as you haven't hit a tin and you haven't hit it too high, it, just, it stays in play. It's like, it's like fun. I recognize that. But is it bringing you any tactical benefit? And the chances are that it's not, especially if you do it all the time. We become adapted to situations very, very quickly. If you play a player who just hits the ball very, very hard, at the beginning that might, you know, might be hard. You might lose the first match that you play them. But if you play them more often, it becomes less and less effective because you become better and better at taking the ball short with short swings and moving them around. So all I ask you to do is honestly look at yourself and say, am I getting the most out of hitting the ball hard? Am I choosing my shots carefully at the right time? Am I just hitting hard thinking it's getting me benefit, but it's not? Number four, not taking the serve seriously enough. Number two was about using the height of the front wall and how we can learn and copy what the pros do. This is the opposite. I think this is an excellent example of why club players shouldn't simply copy everything that pros, professional squash players do. When you watch a professional squash player match, okay, when you watch a pro play a match, when you watch pros play match, matches, you don't often see great serves. Now ask yourself, why is that? Why don't they hit great serves? Well, they might hit great serves if you were playing them, but against other pros, they're not necessarily great serves. And the first answer, possible answer, would be that to be a great serve, it might be a little bit risky. It might actually get too close to going out. It might, you know, if you're gonna go high, then there's too much risk involved. Why would you hit up, try and hit this great serve up if all that's gonna happen is your opponent, if it's like on a you know, backhand side, is just gonna hit a, a, a return anyway. Why risk having a shot that you might not lose? Now, here's the difference between pros and, and club players. Pros are really good at high backhand and quite uh, and good at high forehands. Club players, oh, so I'm sorry, my mouth is just not working today. Club players can be quite good at forehands, they can be, but they're generally not very good at very high backhands because they don't practice them. And if you watch for one of my solo practices, we talk about, I talk about doing that more often. You can strengthen your arm just by doing some swings and by hitting some high service returns back to yourself. So club players are, club, sorry, club pros are good at doing those shots. Sorry, professional players are good at doing those shots. Club players, not so much. So maybe you should develop a much higher serve. Maybe you should develop a serve that comes at your opponent, a serve that goes low. Now, when I say club players don't take the serve seriously enough, what I'm saying is they're not recognizing that this is a huge opportunity to win the point very quickly, either by hitting a shot that is unreturnable or by getting such a weak return that you can win the, win the point immediately. And pros don't do that. That doesn't happen so much. Yes, I know you see the pros hitting cross-court nicks off weak serves, but that's kind of like different. There's a difference between going for a great serve and hitting a weaker serve. And often in those situations, it's like desperation. You know, they're 10-2 they're down. What have they got to lose? One interesting thing about Jahangir Khan is when you watch some of his serves on the forehand side, he served forehand, and generally I always recommend backhand so that you can watch what's happening. You know, when you're Jahangir Khan, you can do anything you want. But he often would serve it so that it came down the middle, the ball would go behind them, come off the back wall, and then the player would be, the returning player would be hitting a serve as if it was just a rally. And that's a really good example. I don't know if that happens too much nowadays, but all he wanted to do was get the ball in play. He just wanted to minimize the chance of losing the point early and get the ball in play because he was confident of his ability um, to do that. And then you hear of other pros years and years ago who would literally win five or six points from hitting such good serves. And we've kind of lost that. And I don't want to be one of these coaches or players that dwell in the nostalgia. Oh, things used to be different. Um, and it was always better back then. But I do believe that you could put more effort into serving and you would see a bigger return. That doesn't mean though, 
overhead serves. I'm not talking about smacking the ball as hard as you can on the serve. I'm talking about realizing that club pro, uh, club players, uh, club players are not very good at high backhands, and your serve should always be very close to to that area of the court. Maybe some at the opponent because that's. Uh, difficult for them, maybe some that hits the sidewall early, and I promise to make a video about serves properly one day. So please think more carefully about the serve. And a final one, which is related to the first one, which was the, the green type of shots, is I see so many players, especially on my video coaching sessions, where People just create an opportunity and I'm like, great, you're gonna go for a winning out. And they hit it to the back. Now there can be a, a long-term tactical benefit or uh, you know, a, a conscious effort to do that, but often it's not. It's often it's not because A, they didn't recognize the opportunity quickly enough, and B, because they're not confident. And I and I have to admit, okay, that's fine. You're not confident about something, then maybe you shouldn't be playing it. But you're never going to get confident unless you do it more often. Yes, you need to do them in practice. You need to sort of hit a sort of a self boast and then try and hit a winner. You need to maybe hit the ball high, let it bounce and go for a cross court nick. You need to hit more practice drop shots and I can't emphasize that enough. Because if you don't practice them, then you're not gonna be feel confident. But the first part of this is recognizing. I have an opportunity here to win the rally. And that's the point of playing the ball into the corners. That's the point of getting the ball tight to the wall. Although I have to say, I personally get more pleasure from making an opponent miss hit the ball because I've it's my shot is kissing the side wall than I do from them hitting a, a weaker shot and I smack a roller into the nick. Yes, smacking rollers into the nicks is great fun but it's so much harder to hit the ball this tight, at least in my humble opinion. So um, realizing that you've got an opportunity to uh, hit a winner, I would recommend, unless it's an actual tournament, and in fact, in one of my mindset tips, I don't know what it, which one it was, it might've been number 50, not that long ago, which was basically practice to improve. If you are not playing a competition, a tournament match, you should be working on things to improve your game, and that can definitely be one of them. It might seem that you're going for lots of winners, but if you've created those opportunities, you know, at least for one of the games in a match, take every opportunity that you can. And in general, I don't want to get too technical now, but in general, if the ball is on your forehand side, assuming you're right-handed, go to the right-hand corner. In general, the ball is on your backhand side, if you're right-handed, go to the left corner, the, the backhand corner. Why? Because if you miss hit a cross court, it comes right back in the middle. If you miss hit a shot that going into the corner, even if it hits the sidewall, it does go into the middle, but not directly back at you. And you might want to just let it get more into the corner. So don't hit it too far to the right, hit it a little bit less. So it's going towards that sidewall when your opponent hits it. And I often see players always going for the cross courts because it seems more dramatic. It seems like it's easier to hit a cross court nick. But in general, you, you'll get more benefit from keeping the ball on the same side. All right, so those were my five tactical tips. If you agree or disagree, let me know in the comments. If you've got others that you want to share, do that. Maybe I'll make a second one of these based on you know some other observations. I haven't decided yet, so we'll see what happens. This is a subscription button. If and only if you think my content is useful, please subscribe. And if you like this video, give it a thumbs up. I don't mind. Over here is a collection of five other things. So videos with five other things. And down here is a video that YouTube thinks is a good fit for you based on what you've been watching. And of course, remember, do something every single day, please, to improve your squash. See ya.